<coughs> okay, so hello everyone, welcome to the last net seminar for the year. Uh, today's speaker is Aditya Akiela, who is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, he got his PhD from CMU back in 2005, and before going to Madison, he spent a year here, where he was part of the Ethane team along with Martin and Nick uh, and other people. So he, his uh, research interests are, are varying between uh, software defined networking and network function lately. Also, he's working on video quality uh, experience and network architecture in general. And today's talk is going to be on the crossroad between SDN and network function and a joint control platform that helps uh, get the benefits from both of them. Thank you. Welcome to my talk. So uh, I'll uh, describe the system uh, we've been building over the past year and a half or so called OpenNN. Um, and it's a system that allows you to exercise joint control um, over uh, network functions or middle boxes and network forwarding state. Okay, and I'll, I'll talk about why that's important and how we achieve that. This is uh, work done by uh, a bunch of my students uh, at Wisconsin. Aaron Gember uh, was the lead student who designed this system. So um, uh, network functions are probably, you know, also called middle boxes. Uh, let me just quickly walk through what these things are. So traditional networks have uh, routers and switches, and they do fairly simplistic things often, like forwarding packets, you know, maybe sometimes quality of service and uh, rate limiting and so on. But often network operators need a lot more uh, functionality out of their networks for security purposes or compliance or performance. And uh, middle boxes or network functions are these <coughs> devices that help them bridge um, this gap. So they are uh, ways in which operators can introduce custom packet processing functions into their um, otherwise very <coughs> simplistic networks. So there are many of these uh, things like load balancers, firewalls, uh, caching proxies, S gate gateways of various kinds, plan optimizers, intrusion prevention systems, traffic scrubbers, what have you. Um, and uh, the, the key thing is that compared to their route, routing and switching counterparts, uh, these devices often do uh, fairly intricate stateful uh, processing. For the packets they see, they do fa uh, fairly intricate bookkeeping uh, in terms of uh, per flow state, uh, what state the connection was in, a uh, session was in, and so on. So why are these things interesting? Well, uh, these are not arcane devices that you would find one in a, in a network or so on. So here's a picture um, from a paper published in SIGCOM a couple years ago that uh, did an analysis of uh, different kinds of devices in about 55 different enterprises. Essentially, the key takeaway from this picture is that in, in the different enterprises that were studied, there are at least as many middle boxes as there are uh, routers and switches. So it's not just in enterprises that you see these devices, but increasingly there, there have been studies that show that these uh, kinds of uh, yeah, special packet processing devices are also common in cellular networks, in ISP networks, and as ad new applications arise or as uh, new devices come into play or new threats emerge, new middle boxes get thrown uh, into the mix. And this, this is a rapidly growing, very diverse uh, market. So the state of the art in these network functions um, and, and, and middle boxes, there are a couple of different trends that are, are, that are driving this. The first is that uh, this term you may have heard, network functions virtualization. Um, and broadly here, uh, what's happening is that there are, traditionally these devices were deployed as hardware appliances. They are increasingly being replaced by uh, software um, devices or you know, virtual machines uh, that run, uh, that package uh, the functions that otherwise used to be implemented as hardware. Um, the uh, advantages here is that compared to the hardware uh, counterparts, they offer much lower cost, they are somewhat <coughs> easier to manage, um, they can be upgraded much more easily. And some recent work uh, that appeared in NSTI last year uh, shows that it's very easy to provision these things. You can spin up uh, new uh, virtual machines that have middle box functionality in as little as 30 milliseconds. So it's, it's very easy to sort of uh, bring these things up, upgrade them, and move them and so on. <coughs> The second trend is the use of uh, software-defined networking uh, to uh, string these uh, functions together in, in a network. So traditionally, these devices, these hardware appliances were, were deployed in choke points within the network, and operators had to cajole distributed routing protocols to force specific traffic subsets to go through those choke points to be processed. Uh, with SDN, you, what you can do is you can actually uh, decouple these devices from their physical location within the network, deploy them off-path, <coughs> 
and then steer appropriate traffic subsets uh, through them. Uh, this is a lot of interesting consequences. You no longer have single points of failure, single points of congestion, and all of that stuff uh, because of this decoupling, so you get a better performance. Uh, but you can also do interesting things like chaining. You can have different kinds of middle boxes deployed at different locations within the network, and then you can use SDN to chain traffic for appropriate uh, traffic sequences. So this is sort of the state of the art in network functions today. Uh, uh, there's, uh, there's another kind of NFV approach, which I call sharding, uh, which has been advocated by Nicira et al., which where they basically take something that you know would normally be a middle box and actually split it, split the processing up into you know usually processing that happens at the edge of the network, possibly like in every VM or hypervisor, and so it's sort of like sharding it uh, sort of by server and splitting it up and pushing it to the edge, uh, which and in that case the middle box itself sort of you know may not really exist anymore. Maybe it's sort of an algorithm in the controller, or maybe it's uh, just a lot of processing that happens. You know, maybe in hypervisors, maybe in the maybe in the VMs themselves, yeah. or, or or the virtual switch. Which one of those? Which one of these is that sort of a combination of this, or or is it a third approach, or we uh, say it fits into either one of those categories? Yeah, that's a good. I, it's not exactly. You know, it's it's, good, it's not that because you slice it up. Right. It's, right. And so, it's leveraged by SDN, but it's not traffic storage. Yeah, absolutely. It's sharding. I think yeah, it's a third approach. Yes. Yeah, so it may be something in between. Absolutely. This doesn't. This is not meant to be exhaustive in any any way. This is just to set up what the rest of the network. That's absolutely one. Interesting way in which network functions can be instantiated, uh, built up from the uh, underlying infrastructure. And uh, what I'm going to describe may have applications for that, but I have to think really hard about sort of what trade-offs are going to be. But for the purposes of this talk, let's assume that this is the set of data. Um, all right. So the, this talk is about uh, what I call um, distributed uh, processing. Uh, this is something that's enabled by SDN, in particular, uh, uh, with uh, in combination with NFP. And here, basically, we are talking about services with abstractions, where uh, you may want to dynamically reallocate processing of traffic um, across different instances uh, uh, of an NF, uh, uh, NF or NF. So the simplest example that comes into mind is something like load balancing, where you have two different instances of middle boxes. When one of them runs hot, we basically use SDN to take some subset of traffic being processed by that and move it to the other uh, middle box. This can give you sort of maximal performance out of those two instances of the middle box at a fixed cost. But the more interesting thing is that when you combine this with NFV, you can use uh, this sort of distributed <coughs> processing and dynamic reallocation as the basis for building interesting new abstractions. So one abstraction, for example, is you can build the abstraction of an infinite capacity or elastically scalable middle box. So one middle box runs hot, you deploy, uh, uh, you can use NFV to quickly spin up additional instances to meet capacity and steer appropriate traffic subsets through them. You can uh, build the abstraction of an always up-to-date, always available middle box. When one of the middle boxes uh, is using stale uh, version of software, you bring up an up-to-date version, um, you, you keep it live, you move traffic from the dated version to the updated version and decommission the old one. Uh, and you can always also build abstraction of middle boxes whose, whose functionality can be dynamically enhanced. So suppose this was deployed inside an enterprise data center, it's processing traffic and it sees something anomalous, but it doesn't have the uh, functionality or the resources uh, to do further analysis, in which case you can invoke a brawnier instance of this middle box in the cloud, take the processing for the subset of traffic for which you observe anomalies and hand it off to this uh, uh, Brownier version, in the cloud, which is the ability to come up with richer analysis for the traffic. Right? So you can build these kinds of interesting abstractions if you're able to dynamically reallocate traffic across different instances of these middle boxes. So the um, what is missing, though, is that in the context of these distributed processing applications where you have this dynamic reallocation, today there is no system that can allow you to simultaneously meet SLAs, so for example, ensure that the deployment as a whole offers a certain minimum uh, throughput. Uh, ensure uh, accuracy or efficacy of middle boxes, that the collection of IDS instances that you're operating as a whole uh, uh, raise alerts for all HTTP flows that are known to contain uh, <coughs> malware. Uh, and keep costs or uh, costs low or efficiency high in the sense that when the resources are not being used, you, you tear them down and, and save on costs. You can use NFP and its combination with SDN to achieve one or maybe two of these, but you cannot simply just use them to achieve all three of them together, and you need something more than the control that NFP plus SDN can give you 
for achieving these simultaneous hits. So let me give you an example of this. So here's a simple example where the goal is for this chain of, uh, of middle boxes, you want to ensure that the throughput uh, stays high and you may want to scale out middle boxes as they become bottleneck to ensure throughput stays high, but you want to keep costs low. Two sets of uh, flows go through this uh, chain of middle boxes and because these are stateful packet processing <coughs> machines, they all establish state for these two sets of flows. Uh, something happens with these two sets of flows, traffic patterns change, volume increases, uh, causing one of these stateful processing entities uh, to become uh, bottleneck. So in order to sustain throughput, you may decide, okay, I'm going to uh, deploy an additional instance of this middle box. So now you have a couple of choices. You may say, all right, I'm just going to wait for new flows to arrive and some of these existing flows to die out. I'm going to move all the new flows here and then that will even out uh, my load and, and get me back uh, the performance that I spoke before. The problem here is that these flows may never really die out or, or go down in volume and there are actually no new flows that you can reallocate to this new instance. So you, you, your bottleneck continues to persist and your SLA suffers. You can say, all right, um, let's forget about that. What we will do is we'll just take these blue flows and move it to the new instance. The problem here is that this associated state that you ended up creating for these blue flows is not available at, at its new location. So this may raise uh, false alerts or false negatives. You may miss some attacks because you don't have the necessary context. And this impacts the NF's efficacy. And in, in, in this is the scale-up case. And in the scale-down case, similarly, when uh, you, know, you don't, no longer need the second instance, you may say, okay, I'm going to decommission the top instance, and the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to wait for flows to die down, and when there's no more activity happening in the middle box, I'm going to just uh, decommission it. But as I'll show later, there are some traffic flows that can last several hundreds of seconds, and so waiting for those flows to drain out can actually span several tens of minutes, if, if not hours in various uh, situations. Yeah. Can you give a sense of uh, what types of statistics uh, some of these things are actually keeping track of, in particular? Um, would intrusion prevention only, to make its decisions, only keep track of statistics per flow, or does it actually, actually make decisions to I'm actually going to go into that in fairly, a lot of detail, because we need to understand that to be able to control that. Okay. Okay. So I'll give you a concrete example, of the special, uh, specifically in the context of the pro intrusion detection system. Thank you. So hold on to that. Any other questions? So, yeah. yeah. Oh, but by accuracy, do you mean that like the intrusion prevention would like not work correctly? Or, do you, or is it more so of So two things can happen. One, it may miss attacks that it would have otherwise detected if it had the combined capacity of these two middle boxes. Or it may um, uh, raise false alarms because it thought something anomalous was going on. Both of those are a pain to deal with for operators. And that will hopefully become clearer with another example later on. Okay, so in this case, what we really need is, in addition to moving the blue flow to the top instance, you want to move the blue box state. Uh, to the instances, new, to the flow's new location. So essentially, what in order to meet all these three things simultaneously, what would be nice to have is a mechanism that allows you to transfer live state while updating forwarding. Uh, so OpenNF is a system that is built for this purpose. It it enables quick and safe uh, dynamic reallocation of processing across NF instances. So these are important uh, adjectives here. Quick essentially means that uh, any reallocation decision invoked by an application, in this case, Elastic Scaleout. Uh, it can be invoked at any time, and it will finish predictably soon. By predictably, I mean to say that it doesn't, the, the amount of time it takes to finish doesn't depend in any um, way, shape, or form uh, on the flow arrival patterns or flow completion patterns. Safe here essentially means that in the context of these distributed processing applications where we are transferring live state, uh, we can guarantee certain key semantics for the live state transfer that the while we are moving state, no state updates are missed. State updates happen in a certain order because these things impact the outcomes of the actions that the middle boxes end up taking. Okay, so this is a system that this is the only system out there that can ensure these two properties simultaneously. And because it can do this, it can enable the creation of rich distributed services applications that simultaneously allow you to meet SLAs, ensure efficiency, um, and uh, uh, and uh, ensure efficacy of middle box actions. So that's what OpenNF is. I'm going to go into details about you know, what it looks like, uh, how we manage state and how we control it, uh, what key ideas we use to get to the point where we ensure safety and liveness properties of different kinds. And I will talk about initial results from, a, um, from the evaluation of the preliminary prototype. <clears throat> so this is sort of roughly what um, OpenNF as schematically uh, looks like. 
Um, there are a bunch of APIs that middleboxes implement to speak to the controller. Uh, controller has a bunch of APIs that various applications uh, use to invoke uh, state transfers. Applications here are things like you know, elastic scaling or dynamic enhancement of middlebox uh, functionality or, or whatever you may have. The uh, applications invoke high-level reallocation operations depending on their internal logic. For example, move this set of flows from this instance to this other instance. In response to that, the controller imports and exports state from different middlebox instances controlled by the application, all the while doing that in coordination with the network. Okay, so this is roughly what the system looks like. So the key, there are a bunch of challenges that we face in realizing uh, the system and ensuring that things can happen quickly and safely. Uh, the first challenge is that we don't want to design the system for a particular uh, class of NFs, like just NATs or you know, a particular class of other devices. We want to be able to be inclusive and be able to bring in as many net different kinds of network functions as possible. One way to do this is to create a, a programming model where we say all NFs have to be written according to this particular way of creating state and managing state. That would make us easier to control the set state, but that may limit the kind of NFs we can bring into the world, right? We don't want to do that. So to this, we, we uh, designed a simple API where we relegate a lot of the uh, state gathering uh, functionality to the NFs, and this will become clear uh, in a second. The second sort of the te technically deeper challenge that we face is in how we guarantee these safety properties that I described. And these safety properties arise because of race conditions. You know, when state is being moved from one instance to the other, packets may arrive at the uh, state's old location, causing state updates. And those updates may be missed, uh, may, may not appear in the state's new location, or they may appear out of order. And state can become inconsistent across different locations of the mirror boxes. Okay, so to do this, we develop a bunch of uh, state update uh, primitives that uh, ensure provably guarantee certain safety properties uh, while the state is moved. And the third thing is that when we are moving this state and we are trying to guarantee all of these properties, we end up imposing a bunch of overhead on, on the metal boxes. They take some amount of CPU away from them, some amount of memory away from them. It also creates extra overhead on the network. And we want to be able to bound that in some way so that they don't interfere with the objectives of applications are trying to realize. And to do this, we designed a fairly careful northbound API that allows applications to you know, invoke certain things or shut, shut certain things down to control over. All right, so <clears throat> let me go into you know, what is the state that OpenNF is actually trying to uh, control. So this addresses your question of you know, what kind of state that, uh, yeah, are we talking about here. So the way we approach this is we looked at a bunch of uh, open source mirror boxes out there and we examined what kind of state they create. And essentially what we realized is that the state that is created or updated by, by uh, a mirror box applies either to a single flow or to groups of flows or to all flows seen by, seen by the uh, mirror box. So here's an uh, example for Bro ideas. Uh, Bro is an intrusion detection system developed at Ixi. It's very widely used um, at a bunch of campuses. Um, so one set of state that Bro maintains is a bunch of per flow state. For every flow that's, that Bro sees, it maintains uh, connection objects. Each connection object ha has a TCP analyzer object and an HTTP analyzer object, which keeps track of TCP level state and HTTP, HTTP session level state. In addition, uh, the Bro intrusion detection system also maintains uh, multi-flow state. It's a state shared across multiple flows. A flow is you know, the traditional five people. So one, one particular example is port counts, which is you know, on a per destination host basis, you look at all the different ports that are trying to connect it. And this is multi-flow state that, of, of, of that kind that's maintained by the Bro IPS. And finally, there's all flow state, which is state shared across all uh, flows seen by the instance, which is some sort of rough statistics on traffic. So we classify state on the basis of this scope. We either talk about per flow state, multi flow state, or all flow state. And using flow as a handle for referring to state is a natural way for us to reason about which state to move and which state to copy or share across metal boxes, because this is also how metal boxes today are designed with respect to how they manage uh, managed state. Okay, so these are the kinds of state we're going to be dealing with per flow, multi flow, or all flow state. So how did you? Uh, yeah. Distance between uh, single uh, state and uh, single flow state and multi multi state flows. So, so the question is what? The previous slide. Uh -huh. So, how, how do you distinguish between multi flow uh, states and all flow states? How do you know that the flow is like requires? Uh, <coughs> yeah. So either of these. Yeah. So basically, uh, it's not. Uh, 
um, an application doesn't uh, uh, exactly need to know what kind of state it is. The, uh, in general, uh, per flow state um, is uh, uh, something uh, that, that you would want to move, right? Uh, Multi-flow state is something that you would want to share. Uh, per flow state is more uh, clearly defined by specifying more fields of the uh, connect connection tuple than a multi-flow state, which can be specified on the basis of just one of the fields or, or, or three fields of some sort. So the application doesn't actually need to uh, uh, know uh, the details. It can, it can, as you will see on the next slide, it can provide uh, a filter and the middle box, if it has multi-flow state, offers that state, or if it has per flow state corresponding to that filter, offers said state. Okay. So for yeah. Bro, you just look at uh, the source code to figure out which one is actually per flow and multi flow and so on. Um, yeah. So in the middle box, yes. So we'll have to we'll have to kind of say, okay, so this is multi flow state in, in Bro, and this is per flow state, and we will need separate handlers for dealing okay. with multi flow and per flow state in case of Bro. But applications themselves don't have to be aware of what nuances there are or how the state is being managed inside the middle. But who is aware of it? The controller is aware of it? Or it's not really clear to me. Who is going to be aware of it? So the, the middle box is aware of it. The middle box. The middle box. So when you rewrite a middle box mm -hmm. to match this API, we need to know what we're talking about. The controller and the applications are agnostic of it. So yeah. this taxonomy may work for Bro, but if you imagine other middle boxes who yeah. might have finer grained uh, states than per flow. <coughs> Absolutely. So let me go on to the next step. Yeah. And sure. we have actually build up this for a bunch of different middle boxes and it'll, it'll become clearer how we deal with that. So essentially the way the API for exporting and importing the state is basically get put and delete f, where f is some filter that describes the state. And for each of these we have the scope. So get multi-flow, get per flow, or get all flows. Um, so fi this filter is defined on the packet header fields. <coughs> so this filter gets handed, uh, you know, the get multi-flow or get per flow gets handed down to the NF instance. And then it is up to the NF instance to identify and provide all the state that matches that particular filter. So if it's much more fine-grained, it will collect everything that corresponds to that particular filter F and hand it off to the But end. the filter might not be defined <coughs> based on flow. Maybe it's based on absolutely. the packet payload. Though. Yeah, absolutely. So, we, so the, we, we don't talk about filters that are on the basis of packet payload mm -hmm. yet. Right now, the filters we deal with are um, either things like URLs um, or uh, uh, the connection. Packet payloads are a slightly uh, harder challenge for us to deal with. Okay. Although there is nothing, we have just haven't implemented that yet. There's nothing fundamental that prevents us from being able to do that. Okay. So, yeah. can you query the state of the middle box? Let's say uh, there is a middle box that keeps log of the long lived flows. Can you query and say, give me the, uh, the, the That's tablet? a great question. Or uh, so, the, so, the OpenNF controller. Um, it, because we want to accommodate a bunch of different uh, middle boxes that could be defined, uh, implemented by different vendors, it actually doesn't know what the state is. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's agnostic to the nature of the state, the, the structure of the state. Um, all it does is it, it allocates state across different instances. Okay. Um, so the application that's designed to work with a particular uh, set of middle boxes may know a little bit more about the specific state for those middle boxes and may be able to do those kinds of queries. But the middle box needs to expose that through the API in, in some, some fashion. The controller itself is agnostic of the uh, nature of the state. So it, it, the, the controller just implements the, the, the transition. It, only it, doesn't, does, it doesn't trigger the transition. It only does reallocation. Okay. That is, th take things from here and move them mm -hmm. over there or copy them over there. So it's a very simple API that it exposes to. So, what are the semantics of the state? Like, uh, as you said, middle boxes can actually be distributed across multiple instances. Yeah. Right? So, are there like some restrictions on what the state's uh, physical scope should be for this interface to work? Uh, so, in general, the application deals with one logical middle box and it queries uh, for state from that logical middle box. Um, in our current implementation, that is tied to actually a physical instance. So, so what is this application here? So the application are things like, uh, uh, sorry, these things. Um, these are applications that run on top of the controller. Okay, and they actually sort of 
at least at a logical level, they know that there are these many instances that I have deployed, uh, or you know, Elastic Scaling would track how many instances are being used, and they deal with those specific things and moving stuff across those specific instances. You can build another layer of abstraction that hides out all of those different instances and presents one logical NF abstraction, in which case the kind of management functions you would be able to do on top of that would not be as fine-grained as you imagine being able to do. No, okay, Let, let's say that there, is, there are like two Go instances here, yeah. and they both track the state for HTTP flows. Yeah. Uh, and they do it in a distributed fashion based on how the network actually routes the traffic. And Bro has its own internal semantics for, hey, this destination IP is consuming like so much amount of HTTP traffic. And uh, the physical state could actually be distributed across these two middle boxes, yeah. right? Uh, so does the open NF controller actually take care of getting the state from each of the individual middle boxes? Aggregating it. Let me so no no no. Let me get to that. So okay. the API will become a little bit clearer once I. So the, right now I'm just describing move. Um, th there are some state that multiple middle boxes would need to share. Like you, would, uh, you know, there's some HTTP processing happening in one instance. Similar uh, processing for an overlapping set of prefixes is happening at another instance. There you would need to share the state you're maintaining for those. And there the NF API doesn't work with. Uh, move, you end up doing copy, which is you periodically copy and keep the state consistent across the instances. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, so, um, the, uh, okay, so basically the, the thing is that NFs don't need to change anything about their internal state organization. They would have to be uh, modified to identify different scopes of state and then respond to the uh, controller by furnishing the appropriate piece of state but they don't have to adhere to a specific way of allocating state or dealing with how state is managed or modified. So let me go into the operations, which is uh, sort of what the applications can do uh, or, or running on top of these different instances. So a high level application, uh, uh, like uh, a load balancer may decide to reallocate um, port 80 flows to a different instance, right? from this instance on the left to this instance on the right. So the first thing we may want to do for this is to move flow specific state a state corresponding to port 80 to this instance. There may be some state that is shared across different kinds of flows, like connection counters, right, which span different ports. That state may have to be copied or shared across the different instances. And essentially what OpenNF provides is various guarantees for these operations. It can ensure that when you're moving state for the per flow state for uh, port 80, that it, it can be moved in a loss-free way or in an order preserving way. And when you're creating copies of state, that you can ensure various notion of, notions of consistency over the copy. Either keep it strictly consistent, strongly consistent, or eventually consistent. So that's sort of you know different sets of operations that you would allow uh, the controller to implement on top of the instances. All right. So this this is sort of like roughly how move would look like. So there are two instances here. Control application issues a move, like we saw in the previous <coughs> example. The controller issues a get port 80 to the first instance. Uh, it, it doesn't know anything about how the instance actually manages its state. In response, the instance, depending on how it internally manages it manages state, may send a bunch of chunks with some opaque identifier to the controller. The controller, uh, once it receives all of these identifiers, issues a delete of that state, and then puts the, uh, the corresponding chunks into the destination instance. Once the put returns, it, uh, uh, it updates the forwarding uh, state such that all the flows corresponding to port 80 now go to instance. This is roughly how a move operation at a high level is implemented. Yeah. So what's a little confusing to me is um, <coughs> what types of consistency mechanisms you have. So like, it, it seems at least that you'd need to make the get and the delete a transaction or something yeah. type or have a lock at the Absolutely. beginning. Absolutely. So I'm going to come to that. So okay. the loss freeness and order preserving semantics that I described are essentially those safety properties that you want mm -hmm. to ensure hold for, for this move. For copy, there are other kinds of traditional uh, sort of Consistency models like eventual or stop. Yeah. 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 Did I misunderstand, or are you deleting the per flow state before you update the, before you actually reroute? Uh, let me come to that. That will become clear when okay. I actually set the race condition and how yeah, yeah. we deal, okay, okay. deal with that. Okay, so, okay. so that was intentional. Yeah, yeah that was intentional. So let's assume that this is kind of how it works and things can go wrong. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so I, I talked about these kinds of semantics. You know, you ask what kind of semantics would you ensure for these state operations? Well, when you're moving live state, what can happen is that some packets uh, may end up at the wrong instance and those, those updates may be lost or they may arrive at the wrong order at some instance. 
Okay. So why does that matter? Right. So you may ask, you know, some middle boxes would probably be, be robust enough to such things happening anyway. So why would that matter? Here's an example of Bro. Recall that Bro often operates in an off-path manner, right? So it only gets a copy of the packet. It's not on path. So here, Bro runs two scripts. There's a vulnerable browser detection script and a weird activity detection script. These are popular things that exist in Bro today. What this vulnerable browser detection script does is it reconstructs MD5 checksums for HTTP responses to look for malware signatures. And this kind of a, this script is not robust to losses of packets. So when packets are lost because of our move, the script may see a hole in the HTTP response, and it may decide either to ignore it, which could be a false positive, or it may decide to compute a checksum with it, which could be a false negative. Okay? So that's kind of why we would want, in this particular case, to make it robust to losses. The weird activity detection script essentially looks at different directions of a transfer, and it looks for SIN and data packets being seen in an unexpected order. So data is getting transferred from server to client, and all of a sudden you see a SIM going the other way, and that is a flag that Pro would raise. And this kind of a, uh, an out of order sequence of actions could be something that our move imposes because of the way we are structuring different events. So the Pro ideas should be robust to losses anyway, right? Because it sits out of power. Yes, absolutely. So given some number of losses within the network, you would expect that Pro would end up with certain uh, a number of false positives and false negatives. We want to ensure that our move doesn't change that baseline. So given that, if that's the output that you would get, we want to be equivalent with respect to that output. Right? Because once you say, well, it's robust anyway, let's just impose losses, you, you don't know how far away from that baseline you end up. Okay. But is that like a well-defined baseline? Uh, it's something, I mean, it's, uh, it's middle box specific. You know, each middle box is designed to deal with some amount of uh, loss or reordering of packets. Um, and then some logic around that determines how the middle box would end up uh, treating that. Okay? Uh, but as I will show you, if you're careless, you can end up losing thousands of packets, and then it is just not clear what the middle box is outcome. So let's talk about this race condition and what exactly would happen. So here's the, the move operation. So packets are, may arrive during a move operation. So a move is issued for the blue flows. You, you start moving the, uh, the blue flows, and when that has been moved, <clears throat> and you've deleted the state, another packet arrives and updates state for the blue. And then the routing for, uh, forwarding update happens. So the problem here is that the second instance is missing this update, and this instance also is seeing unexpected state being updated. Uh, yeah. So this will raise some sort of a false alarm, and this, depending on how the logic is implemented, may either result in a false positive or a false negative. So there, are, there may be a couple of ways in which you can implement this uh, that come to mind to make sure that you're robust to such losses. The first thing you can say is, okay, well, I'm not going to keep forwarding traffic. I'm just going to freeze all traffic, make sure the state move happens, and then let uh, tra blue traffic go to the second instance. Would that work? Would that ensure safety? Well, it depends on what you mean, but I mean, you could lose packets. You could still lose packets, right? Because what would happen is that the packets that and were in transit. The, the timing is also messed up. The timing is harder to deal with. Let's not go there. Uh, but it just, <laughs> so just the law, you cannot prevent losses completely by just doing that. Because the packets that were in transit at the time that you stopped uh, uh, forwarding and you started buffering may end up um, being dropped by the first instance. So you can't completely uh, overcome losses this way. But for the packet yeah. in transit, if you wait, some amount of time, a cyclization, you can uh, eliminate this problem. Absolutely, you except you don't know how long to wait. Uh, yeah. And some of the things that I indicated, you know, there is a service where you're moving processing to the cloud, where you go over the van. It's unclear how long you know, that it, instance would have to wait. Just one delivery. note, one note, guys, because uh, Aditya has a hard stop at 1.15. Let's <coughs> keep questions a bit low, like two minutes ago to the end. Um, okay, so essentially the, the semantics we want to offer in this particular case um, uh, is this loss-free property, which essentially means that all state updates uh, due to packet processing should be reflected in this transferred state, and all packets the switch receives should be processed. Okay, so both of these uh, conditions should be simultaneously met. Those of you who are uh, familiar with the consistent updates paper from uh, uh, Princeton, uh, may think why won't you do consistent updates anyway? So if you just mark packets with certain uh, version numbers, that should kind of take care of this. 
it turns out that it only is, uh, can guarantee that a packet is processed by some switch, uh, by, by some um, instance, but it won't guarantee that the outcome of that processing is reflected where it's supposed to be there. Okay? So there's some subtle uh, detail for why consistently uh, updates won't work. Okay, so the key idea is uh, we have this thing called events uh, that essentially are, are things that uh, NF instances raise that help the controller observe or prevent or stage updates to state as they happen. So here's how the loss free move essentially works. So it's a slight twist on the buffering and stopping traffic idea that I described on the previous slide. So instead of actually um, uh, uh, you know, buffering packets at the switch, what we do is we let the packets go down to the NF instance. We enable events on, uh, on, the, on this instance. Essentially, it, it, this identifies the spe specific set of flows for which these events apply. And this basically says, when you see a packet, raise an event to the controller, but drop it locally. Don't process it. Okay. So um, in this case, uh, uh, when the um, get or uh, delete is issued, the flow, um, uh, the state corresponding to the blue flows uh, moves to the controller. A packet may arrive. The, the event handler catches that, raises an event to the controller. The packet is not processed locally. Uh, at some point, the state is put onto the destination instance. The put returns. Uh, when the put returns, you flush all the buffered events to uh, the destination instance uh, for the packets to be processed there. And at some later point, you update forwarding. And any packet that arrives at the original instance is still caught by this uh, uh, event handler, sent to the controller, and eventually punted to the destination in an instance to be processed. Okay. So, in this particular context, events allow us to let packets go all the way, all the way to the NF instance, uh, and so we can track which specific packets were ended up at the NF instance and punt the processing for them to the eventual destination. Does that make sense? So future packets coming in after routing update are processed by the destination instance. So we can prove that this essentially ensures loss-free uh, move uh, uh, across different NF instances. So things can be reordered. Things can be exactly. reordered, and you might still that's see the buffer step. a lot. Yes, that's the next step. Any questions about the loss freeness, though? <clears throat> well, I mean, you're assuming that the controller can buffer up everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, right. So, so that's a, that's a simplistic design. There are ways of uh, uh, improving. I mean, there are so the buffering can lead to lots of issues, right? You know, uh, first you're you're sending events at line rate to the controller for the entire filter f. Uh, and you know, that itself poses some overhead. Why do it at the controller? Why not just do it at the memory box itself? Yeah. And what happens if you lose the controller itself? Right? Sorry? So what if you lose the controller? The controller. Well, uh, <laughs> sure, <laughs> but that is not specific to OpenMap. Yeah, no, it happens it's in the CNN. But Vimal's yeah. um, so point is a good one, right? Mm -hmm. That the, 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 the middle boxes are already are already scaled out, right? They have a lot of sort of Right, so, yeah. so yeah. absolutely. So basically, so the, the question was, uh, can you have events go from across memory boxes. The, the problem uh, is that we cannot prove safety guarantees there. We don't know uh, whether we have caught all, all possible uh, uh, events. That's a subtle piece of detail. Let me get, get back to that. At least as it stands now, we don't have a, a, a proof for uh, the fact that loss freeness can be ensured if events uh, uh, are sent directly uh, across memory boxes. Okay, by, the by the controller being on path, we can kind of observe what's happening and ensure that the last update ends up getting to the NF instance. We lose that when we leave it to the uh, NF instance themselves. It, it may be possible to be able to do that, but we haven't gotten to that just yet. That was your question. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, so yeah. all these guarantees are assuming no failures? Uh, yeah. Actually, it is assuming yeah. that you can deliver events from the controller to the destination middle box yeah. faster than the events that are generated on the on the original destination. Why? That doesn't. Uh, otherwise, you, you will never be able to resume uh, delivering events uh, like forwarding the events directly, right? If right. if you generate events on the original destination and you're delivering them uh, to the to the, the next destination on a slower rate you will be uh, increasing your buffer essentially of events. Yeah, so, uh, 
so in, in, in the baseline implementation, uh, we actually buffer all the events. When the put returns, when we know that the new state is there, then we release all the events. So we assume there's sufficient buffering at the controller to do that. Um, but that is that can impose arbitrary delays, and that takes a lot of work. Right? We have certain optimizations that I'll get to when I talk about um, the evaluation that allows us to uh, release events as um, state chunks get put at the destination. Mm -hmm. In which case, we, we would be we would be able to move events out of the controller. There, we are certainly assuming that uh, if you want to make, keep the buffer uh, uh, in control, the size of the buffer in, in control, then you would be able to send out events at least as fast as they're generated from mm -hmm. the source instance. Mm -hmm. You would really have to be faster, otherwise your buffer will never drain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But at some point, the forwarding update happens, and then the events stop. Right. So the, what we are talking about is the, is the interval between the state being moved and the forwarding update having kicked in. So there's right, right, a bounded right. amount of time. But if you imagine that the pipes pull it, you know, you're, it's line rate, right? Once you start buffering yeah. things, you'll never drain the buffer yeah, yeah. unless yeah. you'll so, never drain the buffer. Ever. So let's, let's, okay, so the line rate stuff, let's uh, come back to how we deal with that. It's, in, this, in this thing, it's not obvious how we would uh, do it. Um, but, but, you know, hopefully when we move on, it'll become clearer. <coughs> So, uh, uh, Bob, you raised this point about uh, out of order. Right? So, uh, so what could happen is uh, on, on this slide, you know, you uh, the controller flushed packets, and then uh, at some point in step six, uh, forwarding got updated. <coughs> so that's step five. Uh, some packet V2 got flushed um, uh, uh, by the controller, mm -hmm. was sent to the switch, and the switch forwarded it to the uh, eventual destination. Uh, some packet uh, V3 came. The forwarding state has not been updated yet. It went to the original instance. And uh, event got raised, and that got uh, buffered at the controller. <coughs> at some point, forwarding update kicked in. <coughs> the packet B4 uh, ended up going to the destination instance, and the, buff the buffered packet at the controller gets released at some point and arrives out of order at the destination instance. Okay, so this is an issue, uh, w uh, an example where out of order arrivals of packets can happen. And like I just said on, on an earlier slide, uh, bro, it's bro's weird activity script, for example, is one case where it is not robust to such out of order arrivals. So here what we want to make sure is that all packets are processed uh, at NFs in the order in which the switch or the network forwarded uh, them out to either NF instance. Okay? So this is the property we want to ensure. Um, I don't think I'll have the time to be able to go into the details of how we uh, do the uh, order preserving uh, move. But the essential high level idea is that we use events again. Uh, to track the la last packet received um, at an instance. And until we know what the last packet received at an instance is, we buffer all packets at the destination instance. Once we know the last packet received at the old instance is, we release that, have it be processed, and then let the buffer pa packets be processed. That is one way we can ensure uh, order is specific. Okay, so just a, a quick, very high level, fast overview of this. So we flush all buffered packets to the destination instance. We create this set of events on the destination controller. What this says is, on the destination NF instance, what this basically says is each time you get a packet, instead of dropping it, buffer it locally for later processing. <coughs> and uh, after this event gets uh, enabled on the destination instance, we forward packets to go both to the original instance and to the controller. And this way, we can actually track what the last packet seen by the original NF instance is. Once that packet goes to the uh, packet's event goes to the controller, it gets released uh, because uh, th this packet is processed by locally by the controller. You get an event back saying the processing for that packet is done. Once you get an act back for that processing instance, you essentially um, uh, you know, any future packet coming in gets buffered locally. But once you get the act back that packet B3 has been processed, you release all the buffered packets to be processed with the local instance. Okay, so that's. Um, sort of a very quick overview of how we preserve order. Okay. Question, if one or both of this special packet B3 is lost, yeah. what does it happen? That's going to ask the same question. Uh, sorry. Uh, which the, those packets which you used to indicate yeah. that we have completed the transition, if one of those or both of them get lost in the process? Ah, so, so you're talking about uh, you, these packets, yes. Yeah. B3. Uh, yeah, so basically, um, so yeah, so basically in this case, uh, if the packets are lost, um, 
so so one one set of things is that the controller uh, also examines the uh, counters at the switch to uh, understand how many packets have been forwarded and that's one way we can determine when the packets have been emptied out uh, for a particular uh, older uh, uh, forwarding entry for that flow uh, the specific case where loss happens you can that can be your safeguard by examining the counters you can say look uh, I haven't seen any further packets come on this channel, but you know I, I got this event from here. But my counters tell me that the packets seem to have cleared, and at that point you can release the uh, buffered packets. Makes sense. All right. Okay. So uh, so the final thing is uh, just sort of uh, being able to uh, bound the uh, overhead. Um, and essentially, for in this case, we allow applications to control the granularity at which they do various operations, like moving state or copying and copying state, and they can also determine what kind of guarantees they want for uh, certain operations. You know, do I really want both loss-free and auto-preserving, or just loss-free, or uh, um, uh, what kind of uh, copy do I want, and so on. So here's a quick overview of uh, the application that I showed you on the on the previous slide. Uh, so, uh, so the, the things that I described on the on the previous slide will become clear on this case. This is again those two scripts: vulnerable detect browser detection and weird activity detection that I talked about earlier. This is the third script that looks for port scans. So here, what we want to do is we want to move this red flow to the second instance. So the red prefix go from old instance to the new instance. The way this is implemented um, is in doing that, you first copy the uh, the counters or the multi-flow state across the two instances. You move the, uh, the state per flow state corresponding to the red flows from the old instance to the new instance, and you request that that move be loss-free and order-preserving. And because this is state that is shared across the two instances, at regular intervals, you copy from the source to the destination instance and the destination to the source instance to keep these uh, uh, these statistics loosely consistent. <coughs> Okay, so the, we need to copy multi-flow state because the the scan detection script uh, relies on this shared state to be able to uh, identify scans across the instances. The loss free plus order preserving is something that's required by the weird activity detection script that I described. That was looking for transfers going in both directions and out of order arrivals in in the two directions. And the vulnerable browser detection script needs the loss free. Uh, Makes sense. So this is roughly how the load balance monitoring application would look in OpenAI. Okay. <clears throat> so, so going back to some of the questions that I got earlier, so we Bro is uh, so probably the most complex of the different metal boxes we modified, um, and we also looked at a bunch of other uh, metal boxes uh, out there. There's roughly four to ten percent increase in code. The amount of stuff we had to change in each of these metal boxes varied with different metal boxes. Squid was particularly challenging because we had to deal with TCP so socket state, and serializing that and deserializing that was non-trivial. Uh, but in general, the amount of uh, modifications we had to do uh, was roughly bounded to about 10% of the uh, size of the entire code base for these metal boxes. Uh, we've written this controller as a plugin uh, to Floodlight, and the results I'm going to describe are uh, based on a test bed where there's a, a HP broker switch connected with a bunch of servers. Some of these servers act as middle boxes, some as the OpenNF controller, and uh, some as traffic generators. Okay, so this is sort of uh, just measured at the middle boxes. What do get and put uh, performance numbers look like uh, for different kinds of middle boxes and for different amounts of uh, per flow state that you're uh, exporting and importing from those middle boxes. And this is the total amount of time for uh, doing that export and uh, import. Essentially, uh, what we see is uh, when we broke down the costs of uh, what's happening at the middle boxes, uh, it was dominated by uh, having to serialize the state um, uh, and then deserialize the state uh, uh, for put. That was the dominating cost for these two operations. The other key takeaway from this graph is that as the complexity of a middle box grows because of the structures of the state maintained, the time taken to for forget or put to complete uh, also increases. So in general, is the growth like linear? In, uh, in well, at least it looks worse than linear. 
Well, so we go it's, it's linear. So we double the size of state and it kind of roughly doubles in these cases. I don't know what it would look like if it's enormous. Uh, so at least in the in the sets of things we examined here, it's. it's well, it looks for 500. It's it's 400. It's 400 milliseconds. Then for uh, for a thousand, it's more than 800 milliseconds. That would be super linear. Yeah, a little bit more. Little, yeah. It looks like maybe the overhead is increasing somehow, or, or maybe that's just our experimental error. I don't know. Uh, this is, yeah, I mean there, there are to be error bars on this, uh, but at least in the sort of we experimented between 250 to about 2,000 flows. In that range, it, it seems linear. Like I said, if it's there's a large number of flows that we are moving, I don't know what the scaling properties would look like. That's something we need to examine. Pro was designed to handle a huge number of flows. Sorry? I mean, bro is yeah. designed like to have millions, to right? and so I much the larger number of flows. How would you handle that? <coughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, so, it, so, absolutely. We we don't want to. So, we are not moving the end. Uh, at least in sort of like the, the scale out situation or reallocation situation, we're probably not going to move the entire set of millions of flows to a new instance. We'll mm -hmm. probably move piecemeal. So, if it is the case that the scale out is not linear, we would have to stage the moves, right? Instead of saying, okay, move everything now, we would have to kind of divide the process and move, move it piecemeal. That's kind of how we would have to handle it. And that may inflate the overall move time, uh, but at least in this implementation, that's kind of how you would do it. Okay, so this is sort of the high level operation, like, you know, move with the loss free and auto preserving guarantees, what would the performance look like? Uh, here we have some number of flows with 5,000 packets per second for this middle box called PRAGS, and we want to move all the per-flow states from one middle box instance to another middle box instance. Uh, this is the total amount of time it takes to move. So when there are no guarantees to move 500 flows at this particular rate, you take about 200 uh, milliseconds. Uh, this, uh, this parallelizing optimization is something where instead of first getting everything and then putting it, you parallelize the get and put for different chunks. That helps you reduce the time. If you, uh, but the problem here is that a bunch of packets are dropped because you're not actually uh, asking for any guarantees. Is in this specific place for 500 flows, it's about uh, nearly 500 packets that end up getting dropped. With loss freeness, uh, none, no packets are dropped, um, but the overall time it takes, as measured at the controller, for the move to complete uh, inflates by about 2x corresponding to this. Uh, and all those packets are not lost. All those packets captured by events see some amount of delay because they end up going to the uh, controller, they are buffered at the controller, and then they are released. The average delay is something like 175 milliseconds, and the maximum for a given packet could be over 200 milliseconds. Um, there are certain optimizations we could do further. On top of this, this was just parallelizing gets and puts. Uh, this other optimization is uh, uh, ER, or early release. And essentially, here, instead of waiting for the all the puts to finish and then releasing the events, we release events for uh, chunks uh, as they are put at the destination instance. That won't uh, change the overall completion time for the move, but it will reduce the uh, per packet delay because we, you know, the overall completion time is determined by the last uh, chunk we put. And once we have order-free, uh, order-preserving uh, optimized move, that takes the largest amount of time, over 400 milliseconds for the 500 flows. Uh, the maximum delay seen by packets also increases. So what is contributing to the to the, to the delay uh, here? There is a bunch of events being generated by by packets, uh, by the NF instances. Uh, there is an event handler at the controller that's running on a, on a different thread than the get input, but the scheduling across the two threads is not perfect. Um, the the events are once they're generated, they are released to the switch, and the switch forwards them to the eventual destination instance. So they are actually sent as packet out events to the HP switch, and it turns out the HP switch is not very great at processing packet out events. So a big uh, <laughs> fraction, as many of us may have noticed. So a big fraction of this delay is because of that delay imposed by the HP uh, pro curve switch. But at the same time, the overall time it takes for the move to uh, uh, move to finish. Um, could also be uh, optimized if you're able to move smaller, uh, if the application is able to move smaller pieces of, uh, of state. Again, because of limitations with the HP uh, throw curves, which is flow table size that we were dealing with, <coughs> we could not issue uh, really small moves. And we, we could not say, okay, uh, instead of taking this entire filter, 
split it up into smaller filters and issue moves for those uh, smaller filters because the, the switch didn't have the table, uh, that kind of a table size. But if we were able to do that, then the latencies that we are seeing for these packets would go way down because they would be limited by that particular slice that we are dealing with. And that's really the, the way to deal with things like the HP switch, which have very poor like control data plane interfaces, is uh, you, you would hope that you could you could just basically uh, use the switch to handle the control plane and then have some then just you know sort of mirror packets out one data port and then yeah then yeah send them, that's exactly then, the then send them yeah, back yeah, yeah that's back. exactly the optimization that we are currently working on. It takes out the latency issues imposed yeah, by exactly that's by and as long as you don't care about yeah. You know, possibly, as long as you don't care about the ingress port yeah. information being lost, yeah. then that works great. Yeah, and we can actually get around that as well. I'd be happy to talk about that. Oh, uh, really? But, uh, well, playing some addressing tricks will be oh, yeah. and okay. masking things and yeah. Yeah. There's, 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 there's no trivial way to do it, unfortunately. Okay, so, uh, so the, uh, these delays in this case are, are packets that are either buffered in the controller or at the destination instance waiting to be sequenced with respect to other packets. So the key thing though is that these, this delay is not dependent in any way on the flow arrival or departure packets. It's purely a function of the load on the middle box, the, the speed of processing of the middle box, and the amount of state you're transferring. Uh, copy uh, imposes about, uh, can finish about 111 milliseconds for this 500 uh, flows that we have here. But if we want really strong guarantees on shared state, that is very expensive in our current implementation. For every packet, we impose a 13 millisecond data. So this is something we don't advocate doing with. And if, although we haven't seen many instances where middle boxes would need strong uh, consistency properties for shapes. Okay. So these guarantees come at a cost, so applications may want to be careful about picking one uh, guarantee versus the other, depending on their uh, overall optimization. So this is uh, some sort of results where we compared OpenNF with other uh, uh, examples where, you know, for example, you instead of scale out and using OpenNF, you can do VM replication. That it turns out because the VM has uh, unneeded state can result in incorrect log entries for for row. Um, if you can only do forwarding control only, where you just wait for flows to drain out and then uh, let's say scale down. Uh, again, in the uh, traffic trace we collected, there were some flows that lasted as long as fifteen hundred seconds, and so the scaling down would be deleted as well. Okay. So that's actually the end of my talk. Uh, I, there are a lot more details that you could find in the paper, or you know, feel free to ask me questions about it. But at a very high level, what we wanted to do is to build a system that allows quick reallocation of state, but at the same time, you'd be able to, at least within certain conditions, be able to reason about the kind of semantics those reallocations uh, would offer. Uh, and we wanted to make it low overhead and ensure that the amount of modifications we would refer out of middle boxes are also minimized. You can go to this website to see more details. So I have a little bit of time for some more questions if people, if there is something that I, I left unaddressed. In your research, how do you identify flows? I mean, what what process of flow do you have? Uh, what is the handle we use? Yeah. How do you identify flows? How do you know something is a flow? Where do you get that information from? Um, how do you classify traffic in flows? So, the, the API essentially is based on the connection 5 tuple. Right? That is uh, uh, how we define uh, as a flow. Uh, so, like you know, so source address, destination address, source port, destination port, right. and protocol. That's what defines the flow for us. There are some middle boxes like uh, 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 like uh, like a packet cache or a redundancy eliminator where you're keeping chunks of content. Mm -hmm. right? There, there is no flow. All that exists is a bunch of shared content across all flows. So, such a middle box will only have all flows state. Right. Okay, and we uh, and the set of filters that you could provide for those middle boxes will also be more restricted. Okay. Um, so there's no automatic way for us to tell what the scope of the state handled by a particular middle box is as of now. We need to do some more instrumentation and analysis of middle boxes to identify what scopes of state. Because okay, usually can. when you do flows, I mean, when it's open flow, some other yeah. technology, you know, I mean, you have to first identify that something is a flow. And then also you need to identify that, okay, this is the last packet, so we need to wrap up the state right? and say that this flow is done. Right? So, so I didn't see how you do that. Or maybe you take that for granted in your research and say, you know, someone has to take this flow classification somehow or? 
So wait, is your question about when do you identify a flow? <coughs> yeah, how do you know something is a flow, right? Because you're dealing with flows here, you say all these flows. So how do you know something is a flow? Right. The, we just use the connection tuple as the handle for identifying. Yeah, but who is doing that classification? That's what I'm asking. Is the, the controller or who, who does that? So it's, it's not, uh, the controller is actually not doing any classification. The, okay. the applications issue these things that, so a flow is not actually like a, a TCP flow, it's something yeah. that enables, a, a, that uh, that labels an ensemble of traffic mm -hmm. that a particular middle box is maybe handling and you want to move that ensemble or copy state corresponding to that ensemble someplace else. That ensemble may actually have a bunch of TCP flows in it and there may be state for different kinds of, uh, different kinds of state for those TCP flows that the middle box itself maintains. The API essentially doesn't distinguish what those little pieces of state are. It's up to the middle box to gather all that state and provide it to the controller. So the controller is not actually active. If I understand it correctly, since you're dealing with open flow switches, the traffic, the, the, the granular, the sort of unit of traffic classification is an open flow flow entry. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and so other information that you might care about, like, oh, who's the user? Is he authenticated? Uh, What's the application? Yeah. Is, is not encoded in it because the open flow switch is not dealing with it. Yeah, you don't have it, right? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks.